Hey, well, good evening, one and all, and welcome uh, to another in our Conversations on the Catholic Imagination series. Uh, tonight's event is a book discussion based on a recent release from Slant Books, A Relevance of the Stars, Christ, Culture, Destiny, a volume of essays and talks uh, given by the great Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete, uh, bundled in a, in a one of a kind uh, collection. Our event tonight features book editors Lisa Lacona and Gregory Wolf in conversation with Monsignor Albacete's longtime friend, Capuchin Franciscan friar Sean O'Malley, the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston. We're so delighted to have these three wonderful people here to speak about a fourth, the larger than life Lorenzo of blessed memory. Please check out the bios of our esteemed guests on our webpage so that we can conserve time for what uh, promises to be uh, substantive and, and rousing <laughs> because the spirit of Monsignor Albacete will, is certainly will be with us. Uh, I'm, I'm Michael Murphy and I, um, I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola and I'm coming to you live from one of our many Loyola uh, outposts here in digital, uh, through the wonders of digital technology. And uh, on behalf of the Hank family, whose generous endowment funds our many endeavors, uh, and on behalf of our office manager, Patty Delgado, our uh, graduate student assistant, Adam High, and our undergraduate intern, Grace, I extend a warm greeting to all on the call tonight. <clears throat> Greg and Lisa will be facilitating tonight's conversation, uh, but I'll be back with, uh, with you uh, at comment and Q&A time sharing the insights and questions uh, that our audience enters into the proceedings via the chat function. So with that in mind, just let me give you a couple of housekeeping items as they say, before we begin. Uh, first, a note on our format, just kind of hinted at it. Uh, and uh, the, the Zoom, the, the, it's a meeting, so the chat is in play but uh, it's kind of clamped down. So you can kind of send a message to all the speakers, but I'd ask you to direct your questions, your comments uh, to me, and then I can kind of vet and get, as, get to as many of these questions as we can so that our panel can respond. And I always say, if you think about it, write it down. Uh, it keeps it going. It helps me organize as I'm listening along with you, and we'll get there. Um, number two, if this, if this event were an in-person one, and how I wish it were, uh, we'd be selling books in the back corner. So let's keep that spirit alive uh, in this virtual space. Uh, we're gonna put in, into the chat uh, a link to the Albacete book, The Relevance of the Stars, but we're also gonna put a link to uh, all the great titles at Slant Books as well. Uh, Greg Wolf, as you know, or may not know, did all of us an indescribable service in his founding of Image, one of America's leading literary journals, uh, which he edited, founded, uh, blood, sweat, and tears for 30 years. So many on this call owe Greg uh, a debt of gratitude for shepherding conversations in art, faith, and mystery. Uh, and these conversations were the ones that uh, Cardinal Sean and Lorenzo got into more than once. And you can see those online as well. So with that, I wanna welcome Lisa. Great to meet you. Cardinal Sean, a pleasure to meet you, uh, your eminence. And of course, Greg. And Greg, the Zoom stage is now yours, my friend. Thank you, Mike. It's an honor and a pleasure to once again be a participant in the kind of serious, timely conversations that the Hank Center fosters about the church and the world. And of course, I'm very honored to be present today with my colleagues, Lisa Lacona and his eminence, Cardinal O'Malley. I just wanna say a few quick words by way of framing today's event, because for many in the audience, today's session may be a little bit unusual. It's a book presentation. We're presenting a book. What does that mean? Well, in my experience, this format is much more popular in Europe and Latin America than it is here. But I think it's worth doing for a number of different reasons. We're talking about a man who was, to be honest, briefly famous for a brief for a time in the late 90s and the in the aughts of this new century, and who is now sadly gone from us. Someone who very few people today know in a direct sense, 
very well. And the book under discussion is from a, a small and somewhat obscure publisher. And so we need to do some remedial work to try to bring this man and his legacy forward and into this new century fully. Uh, and hence the desire to put the book together and, uh, and to have this session today. Let me just go over a few of the things I think signify the significance of Lorenzo Albacete for our time and what we hope to touch on during the course of our conversation. The first reason to do an event like this is that Lorenzo himself had absolutely no interest whatsoever in self-promotion. And that's in part why Lisa and I had some hard work to do because he was a man who was living always in the present moment. Somebody would come to him and ask him to give a talk. He would do, give a talk and if, if we were lucky, he would write it up and in notes with plenty of typos and he would leave it on his hard drive and never think about it again. Uh, he was a man who was always focused on the other and never really gave a thought to putting his work together um, for publication. Really, people had to come after him to make any of this possible. And the book, this book is, is one sign of that. Another reason that we're doing this is that Lorenzo Albacetti was one of the great all-time characters. Uh, and, as, as Mike said, and a larger-than-life personality. And in this case, um, not just because he was funny and hilarious and free, and he was all of those things, but because his convictions, his deepest beliefs, and his personality were truly mirrors of one another. They were integrated. He wasn't just a, you know, an academic theologian who happened to be able to tell jokes. His, his full human personality and his vision were absolutely one and the same. And, and frankly, he deserves to go down in legend as, as one of the you know, most amazing people in the American history of the American church. Another reason we want to discuss the significance of Lorenzo Albacete <clears throat> is that in some ways, his own witness and life and writings and speeches signify a, a turning point for the lay movement communion and liberation in North America. As many of you may know, this movement was founded by Father Luigi Dusani in the 1950s in Italy. It's been present in the States now for decades, of course, uh, but we've always had a phenomenon in the movement of <clears throat> a language that is very Italian in its rhetorical style and elements and with many uh, unusual terms. And I think it's really in the work of Lorenzo Albacete that the genius of Father Giussani really finally enters an American idiom in a way that demonstrates its power and its vitality for our culture. But of course, this is precisely an ongoing process. I remember a priest friend of mine uh, who will go nameless because he's now an archbishop, uh, once said, you know, I, I think Giussani was an okay guy, but all this language of encounter and event and the heart, I don't know, it sounds a bit touchy-feely to me. And I really had to laugh because he couldn't really have known that this charism is really founded on a vision that's absolutely the opposite of touchy-feely subjectivism. It's in fact about what happens to us when we encounter something outside of ourselves, an other who invades us, who, who calls us, and that encounter calls us out of ourselves. And yet the language of the movement does need translation. And I think Albacete achieved that in a way that deserves to be much more widely known. He was a man who I've said speaks in American idiom. Well, I need to qualify that. He was also a Puerto Rican by birth, a man of Latin culture. And he always, uh, <clears throat> that was central to his identity. And what made him, I think, such an interesting person and such an interesting thinker, he was in many ways an, out, an insider in the church. <clears throat> he had the ear of, of great bishops and archbishops and popes and cardinals. He was a brilliant theologian who was consulted by them all the time. But he was also a man of the people, 
<clears throat> he was also happiest, I think, when he was with his parishioners, with his fellow members of the movement. And so he was an outsider to American culture. He appreciated it, but brought to it an element of friendly skepticism and affection that I think really gives his work a kind of unique power to speak to those of us who are native. Finally, I would just say, if Father, if Monsignor Albacete's vision of the faith uh, really spreads, it will, I think, bring about a great wave of renewal, um, because I think he speaks to a church that has too often been hampered by moralism and doctrinalism and too easily lured into the divisive culture wars and, and lacks at times the spirit of positivity, of hope, and of the ability to engage everyone, whether believer um, or uh, Protestant, Catholic, Jew, Muslim, uh, around the world, that capacity to speak up human language about the deepest things, the religious sense, made him able to communicate with so many power, people powerfully and enduringly. So I hope that we cover these and other topics as we uh, chat today. And now to give us just a little bit of background so we know who this man was and how his life evolved, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Lisa Lacona. Thank you, Greg. Um, I want to start off by just thanking the Hank Center for inviting me. Thank you, Mike, for that beautiful introduction. And I'm, I'm so grateful to be here with you, with you, Greg, and also with you, Your Eminence. Um, I, I'm going to start us off here with a little, with a little bio, with a little kind of uh, context for uh, this extraordinary figure, Monsignor Lorenzo Albacete. Um, when we put together the relevance of the stars, which is, is one of the great joys of my life um, thus far, um, we realized that uh, Monsignor's background uh, was important. It's important to see these moments in his life that um, these turning points that give a lot of insight into his own thought. As Greg said, there's a real, there, in Monsignor, there's an amazing unity of uh, of his experience and his thought. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna just lay out a few of these turning points in his life that ground our discussion here tonight. He was born in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, Puerto Rico in 1941. Um, and, you know, into a, into a loving Catholic family. In fact, he, he later said that he was born into a culture in which Catholicism was like the air that one breathed. Um, as a young man, he chose to come to Washington, D.C. for graduate studies. And um, after getting a master's degree in space science and applied physics, he spent several years working at the Naval Ordnance Laboratory in Maryland. Um, and this is where, um, in the midst of, you know, in the midst of conversations with uh, his colleagues about, about faith and culture, he starts to discern a call to the priesthood. And in 1974 was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of, of Washington and, uh, and quickly became a theological advisor to Colonel William Baum. It was while working for, um, for the Cardinal that he had this really de decisive encounter with a little known Polish Cardinal, Carol Wojtyla. And this was a story that, um, that Monsignor Abbasete told all the time, a beautiful story. Because when he, um, when when Wojtyla came to visit the United States, when he came to D.C., um, he was not considered likely to be elected pope. And when uh, obscure cardinals, Polish cardinals, showed up, they didn't get the red carpet treatment. They got uh, someone like Monsignor Albacete to drive them around town. <laughs> so he was able to develop this uh, beautiful relationship with uh, Wojtyla and a friendship was born. And this was really one of the things about Monsignor that I think will be thematic tonight were these friendships that he developed. He had a, an incredible capacity for friendship. Um, a few years later, that lowly Polish Cardinal becomes Pope. And soon after that, uh, Albacete goes to Rome for graduate studies and actually puts his energy into studying the work of his friend. 
um, now Pope John Paul II. So he got a doctorate in, uh, with a specialty in the theological anthropology of John Paul II. Came back to the States. He was instrumental in founding the Pope John Paul II Institute in Washington, DC. And that is actually where I encountered him. Uh, I was a student in one of his classes, several of his classes um, in the early nineties. Um, and he was, uh, he was a decisive influence and a, a figure that always had a cluster of students around him. Um, he was there in DC for nine years had a year, uh, spent a year in Puerto Rico, returned to Puerto Rico to serve as the president of the Pontifical University of Puerto Rico there, and then came back to New York and took on a post at Dunwoody, St. Joseph Seminary in New York City. And, and this, is, this, this was a very interesting point in Monsignor Albacete's life because he, um, he developed at the same time, he, he, he developed friendships um, unexpected friendships in New York City with people that were really part of the media elite, writers, producers. Um, and, and once again, it was out of these incredible friendships that new things were born. He wrote, um, he was invited to write a cover story for the New Yorker. He wrote for the New York Times. He was invited to uh, be on CNN, the Charlie Rose Show. And, 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 um, and then there was a lasting friendship with Helen Whitney, who is a producer for PBS and, and involved him in a lot of her work. Um, and so there, was, there were these unexpected friendships that grew up uh, with, with people that were really outside of the normal, uh, the normal uh, track that a Catholic priest would, would be part of. Um, at the same time, there was this encounter that happened in the 90s with Luigi Giussani that John that Greg just mentioned. Giussani um, was someone that Monsignor Abbasete met through uh, his friend Angelo Scola. And, um, and Giussani was just exploded his world. Up until this point, Monsignor Abbasete was a, a great devotee of the work of Pope John Paul II, continued to be a devotee of John Paul II. But it was as though Giussani had brought uh, a new depth to the work of John Paul II, to his thought. And Giussani was, um, the encounter with Giussani really answered questions that Monsignor Albacete had had since his early days, um, questions about faith and culture how to live the faith in the world today. How could we encounter Christ in the concrete experiences of our life? So the encounter with Jasani exploded his world. And, and um, in, 2000, in the year 2000, Father Jasani asked Monsignor Albacete to take, take a hand in leading the CL community in the US. Now Monsignor's, Monsignor Jasani's work with uh, community liberation had begun in the 50s with a small group of high school students. But by this time, by 2000, it had exploded in, in a movement in the church. And throughout the country, throughout the US, there were all these little fledgling communities of communal liberation. Albacete began uh, crisscrossing the country, visiting these small communities, giving talks, retreats, um, book presentations. And he became, quickly became a beloved figure um, he spoke repeatedly at the massive cultural festival that the, that the uh, movement has in Rimini, Italy. He was a beloved figure at New York Encounter. Um, and at the same time, he published the single book, uh, single major collection of his writings, God at the Ritz, that uh, we had up until this point, up until we brought the relevance of the stars out. Um, and you know the the thing that that I think will come out in our conversation tonight, the beautiful thing is how all of these relationships were relevant in his life. They formed him, and certainly when he passed away in 2014, the outpouring of love that that came forth at that time from a wide spectrum of figures was evidence of how um, relevant and how decisive his influence was on 
for, was for so many people. At that time, um, at Monsignor Abbasetti's funeral, His Eminence Cardinal Sean O'Malley gave the funeral homily. I was very grateful to have the opportunity to be there that day. Um, and I'd love to hand it on to you now, Your Eminence, to share something of your experience with Monsignor. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, uh, when I was growing up, uh, wherever you'd visit a house, they always had uh, many Reader's Digest lying around. I don't know how many people read Reader's Digest anymore, but two of the most popular uh, columns that they had, one was Laughter, the Best Medicine, and the other, which is probably the most read part of Reader's Digest, was the column that was the most unforgettable character I ever met. And uh, if I were asked to write for Reader's Digest, I'm sure that I would write about Lorenzo Albacete because he is not only the most unforgettable, but one of the most lovable uh, characters that I have ever met. Uh, I am so grateful to all of you, to uh, Oliveta Danese, to you, Lisa and Greg, uh, for all that you're doing to help more people know uh, the legacy of Father Albacete, who uh, made such an extraordinary contribution during his life. But we have the, the treasure of his writings and his vision that he shared with uh, so many people. I met him probably in... 1968. Uh, I was Brother Sean at those days, a seminarian, Capuchin friar, studying at the Capuchin Monastery near Catholic University, and uh, working with the Hispanic immigrants at uh, St. Matthew's Cathedral. And uh, Lorenzo, as a young layman, uh, was often very involved in the activities of the cathedral. Uh, with Monsignor Kuhn and the wonderful uh, staff and people that were there, Rosario Corradero and so many people that were uh, dear friends of Lorenzo's. And it was there that, uh, that I first met Lorenzo and where uh, Lorenzo first met Cardinal O'Boyle, who was eventually the prelate who received him into the seminary. But uh, typical of Lorenzo, uh, he arrived at the cathedral one evening and there wasn't any parking. So he parked in the Cardinal's parking space, of course. <laughs> and before he could get out of the car, uh, Cardinal O'Boyle's car pulled up behind him and the Cardinal got out and went over and rapped on the window. Lorenzo lowers the window and he said, uh, who are you? The Cardinal was sort of a curmudgeon. He was a wonderful prelate, but he was, <laughs> he could be tough. And Lorenzo very calmly said, I'm the Cardinal. And Cardinal Boyle said, I'm the Cardinal. And Lorenzo said, yes. He said, you're the daytime Cardinal. He said, but I'm the nighttime Cardinal. And with that began an extraordinary friendship uh, between Lorenzo Albacetti and, and, and Cardinal Boyle. Those were challenging days in the church. Uh, we were in that period of great upheaval after uh, the Second Vatican Council. And there was a lot of polarization in the church. I mean, sometimes, you know, we look back on this golden age that really never existed. We had our crosses and conflicts and problems in those days. and. Uh, but Lorenzo was a master at uh, being able to speak with everybody and listen to everybody. Uh, Pope Francis has called for this synod on synodality, which is about encountering people, listening with the heart uh, in an atmosphere of prayer and discernment to discover God's will uh, for 
us individually and for the church. Uh, that is something that was part and parcel of the life and, uh, and personality and charism of Lorenzo Albacetti. He had such a great capacity to listen. He was you know, slow to judge, slow to anger. Uh, and as the Spanish talk about someone who has don de gente, the gift of people, he had a gift for relationships that was just extraordinary. And uh, he was not intimidated by grandeur or wealth or power, and, and nor was he put off by weakness, uh, sinfulness, uh, or whatever debility a, a human being might have. He would could be friend to presidents and janitors, uh, to popes and waitresses at the IHOP, uh, where he would take me at one o'clock in the morning for chocolate chip pancakes and uh, conversation about uh, uh, what was happening at the John Paul II uh, Institute. People would see him tall and blonde and fair and say, you don't look Puerto Rican. And he would always get a kick out of that because there was no one who was more Puerto Rican than Lorenzo Albacete. His love for Santurce, for Sagrado Corazon, his parish and the colegio where he had studied, for his family, his friends, his classmates, his devotion uh, to his mom, Conchita, and, and his sister, Manolo, uh, was just extraordinary. And of course, we all delighted in his sense of humor, in his sense of the absurd. Uh, he was also a very, very cultured person. And one of my joys for many decades was, uh, I had specialized in uh, Spanish and Portuguese literature at Catholic University. And, uh, and Lorenzo and I would, try and read the same books and then uh, call each other late at night and comment on the different purple patches that we would find in these books. And, and sometimes would, uh, when we would meet, we would only have to say a little phrase and it would uh, put us into uh, hysterical laughter because we had a way of communicating about uh, the literature that we studied together. It was wonderful. He was often a very irreverent observer of human nature, uh, but he was deeply compassionate. He was the most non-judgmental person that I have ever met in my life, which allowed him to enter into a deep and profound dialogue with uh, contemporary intellectuals and personalities from the media, and he was so non-threatening and open to people that it caused people to come to him and open their hearts to him. He was uh, a great uh, spiritual mentor to so many. Uh, at the same time, he was a man of uh, very deep faith. And I often uh, think of that book that Austin Ivor came out with a few years ago when he started uh, the Catholic voice is called How to Defend the Faith Without Raising Your Voice. I mean, we're living in an age now where there's so much shouting going on. People are always yelling at each other. Uh, Lorenzo not only did, didn't raise his voice, but he would have everybody laughing and eating out of his hand uh, because he knew how to express the truths of the faith in a, in a fascinating way that allowed people to. Uh, look again with new eyes uh, at what the church was teaching and to discover that it, it wasn't uh, as superficial or as, uh, uh, as goofy as they thought before. And they discovered uh, the beauty of the church's teaching. His personality and intellectual acumen helped many people many naysayers to come to embrace the faith 
or at least to appreciate the beauty and the, the complexity of the Catholic, uh, the Catholic worldview. Uh, certainly uh, his uh, tra trajectory, as I say, in those early days after the council, uh, when there was such effervescence around so many issues in the church, uh, Lorenzo was involved with Triumph Magazine, Brent Bozell, uh, who was Bill Buckley's brother-in-law. And, but it was really Cardinal Baum that, that allowed uh, Lorenzo to enter into uh, the world of theology and uh, his friendship uh, with John Paul II and Pope Benedict and later Don Giussani uh, were uh, such a gift to Lorenzo and enriched his thought and uh, and he was also uh, a genius at being able to explain the vision of John Paul II, his anthropology, the theology of the body, and uh, his involvement in the foundation of the John Paul II Institute was, uh, uh, was such an important turning point in his life. And uh, in those days, uh, uh, Monsignor Cafara, later Cardinal Cafara, uh, would come to Washington uh, for meetings. And of course, Cardinal Scola was uh, also very involved in uh, in setting up the John Paul II Institute. Uh, I always share the story about at one point, uh, the Holy Father asked Lorenzo to come and give him some ideas about the structure of the Institute and so forth. And, and Lorenzo showed up in the apostolic apartments and he was there with uh, a, a very pious uh, theologian from Opus Dei who was in his cassock and, and uh, carrying a, a beautiful uh, folder with a very carefully typed uh, a document to present his recommendations uh, to the Holy Father. And of course, Lorenzo was there in his rabbi that probably had about two weeks menu on it. And, uh, uh, and after the the Opus Dei priest made his presentation, which he began by saying, Your Holiness, I did not sleep last night knowing that I was going to be in the presence of the Vicar of Christ this morning with the responsibility of sharing his thoughts. So, of course, Lorenzo, when he began his talk to the Holy Father, said, Your Holiness, he said, I slept very well last night. I just want you to know that. And then he pulls out this big envelope that he had scribbled things on. And he said, actually, this envelope came from the Riggs Bank. He said, I had an overdraft in my checking account. <laughs> and, and they sent me a notice. And then, of course, made an extraordinarily brilliant uh, presentation of his ideas. Uh, when I heard about this, it put me in mind of when Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure were called before, I guess, it was Pope Urban to present their hymns for Corpus Christi. And uh, when Thomas Aquinas presented the Ponte Lingua and all of the other beautiful hymns and prayers that he had written, uh, they looked over at, at St. Bonaventure and he just ripped his, his hymns up. But uh, Lorenzo, in that wonderful friendship he had with the Holy Father, uh, found such a joy and strength. And uh, of course, uh, you had mentioned his going to, uh, to the Pontifical University in Ponce. We were all very pleased when he was given that, uh, that post uh, and I remember going down for his installation ceremony and so many of his friends and family and uh, all of the bishops of Puerto Rico and, and some other 
bishops from outside of Puerto Rico were gathered there. And Lorenzo appeared on the stage wearing uh, the academic robes for the university, which is dedicated to our Blessed Mother. And so it was sort of a, a powder blue gown with uh, uh, royal blue uh, velvet stripes on it and this little bonnet with a, a gold tassel and he's holding something that looked like a scepter. And I was standing next to him and he whispered to me, he said, well, if this doesn't pan out, he said, I can always get a job with Walter Mercado. Walter Mercado was a TV psychic uh, with a kind of Libria, uh, Liberace-esque uh, flamboyance in his dress, wigs, and jewelry that he wore. Uh, unfortunately, uh, his words proved to be prophetic because things did not work out at, uh, at the university. And that was a very uh, sad moment for those of us who loved him and supported him. But we were happy that he didn't turn to uh, Walter Mercado looking for a job. Uh, but eventually, uh, as we say, God always brings good out of evil. That, that door closed and another opened uh, where he went to Dunwoody, which also was a meteoric career, <laughs> but it did give him the opportunity to uh, encounter the, the thought and eventually the, the person of Don Jasani, and that uh, was so mutually beneficial. It, it really uh, allowed Lorenzo to find his intellectual home. And it also uh, allowed the CL to grow in the United States. And um, so often uh, movements coming from Europe uh, that had grown so fast in European churches uh, really struggled in the United States. This is true of, I think, all of the, the apostolic movements, but uh, Lorenzo uh, was perfectly positioned to be able to introduce the CL into a whole generation of Catholics and young priests who became uh, very, very involved. And the annual retreats that he gave to the priests were such an important aspect of his ministry. Once again, uh, his deep humanity and spirituality allowed people to open up to him and to, uh, to be able to tap into his wisdom. And uh, so uh, we're so grateful to, 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 uh, to Lisa and Greg for having uh, produced this, uh, this wonderful uh, book. And we're anxious to hear some of their uh, thoughts about it. Uh, uh, I always would tease Lorenzo. He was born on January the 7th. And of course, in Puerto Rico, uh, Christmas is really celebrated in Los Reyes, the, the Feast of the, the Kings. The, uh, uh, the epiphany and he arrived one day late but uh, he was often late for things so that was, it was not surprising but uh, the epiphany uh, is graced by the the star of, of Bethlehem with that led the the magi and that star that uh, uh, led Lorenzo during his whole life was his deep abiding faith and love for Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. And uh, so I am just so grateful to all of you who are helping to pass on this legacy and help people to discover uh, the, the, the richness uh, of this, this man who uh, has been a gift uh, to the Catholic Church and a gift to the priesthood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Eminence.
to bridge us over to a discussion of some of the major themes of uh, Monsignor Abbasete's thought, um, I thought it might be intriguing just to pause briefly to consider both the human and the larger theological ramifications of the encounter with Father Dusani, because it really always struck me that there was a great human drama here. And I think as His Eminence has, has suggested, um, Monsignor Albacete was someone who was succeeding in many ways in the world, but hadn't quite found the right ultimate place. And uh, he was someone who uh, had the ear of popes and cardinals, um, and yet there was kind of a longing that uh, that was probably still there. I always wondered what you know what he really felt about this major jag in a life. Um, in his mid fifties, he encounters this thinker and and the entire course of his, the next 20 years of his life changes. And I finally found a passage where he really does reveal a kind of human um, response. And it's so typically Albacete and that I, I just have to indulge myself by reading it. We quoted in the introduction to the book, but I found it in an obscure talk he gave to other people in the movement. I think a very casual moment when he felt free to be able to speak honestly to people. He said, I am proud to consider myself a son of Father Giussani, but making me find this towards the end of my life, I began to be, be even a little bit angry. The removal, the setting aside of whatever theological knowledge I had in order to try out what Father Giussani was trying to teach me was done because I knew that it was a fuller knowledge. I set this anger aside because this path led to amazement. And for other reasons, it included the heart, the desires of the heart. The decision to try that out was a costly decision, but it was a decision that I made willingly. And here's this quintessentially Albacetian moment. Why, he asks, because I am very saintly? No, because what is at stake is my ass, the future of my ass. And for me, this just was a, a moment of, of real drama and, and honesty and beauty. Um, sometimes this kind of experience of vocation happens in ways that aren't necessarily pretty, that can be profoundly disruptive, and yet at the same time liberating. So as we now try to talk about at least some of the major themes that Monsignor Albacete adumbrated with such grace and wit, um, I don't know if the Cardinal is still available to us, but you know, one question we have is, is what, what are these gifts that he was able to bring to the present moment? We've talked a bit about a church that is very, in the midst of a kind of very divisive um, moment uh, where it seems like in order to be serious about our faith, we have to pick sides and, and, and stigmatize the, the other side and, and really talk in extremes that everything is the apocalypse. And the spirit of serenity and of calmness and of listening that Monsignor Albacete had seems to be very much an antidote to that. Your Eminence, do you, do you agree with that? Well, that's why I, you know, talked about Pope Francis's uh, ideal of synodality. I think it, uh, Lorenzo expresses that so well. You know, some people think synodality means meetings about meetings. No, it means being on a path with others in dialogue and prayer to discern God's will uh, for our for our future and. Uh, this is the, the kind of uh, life and vision that, that Lorenzo had. Uh, uh, he was not afraid to take on difficult issues and talk about them, but it was never done in the spirit of uh, the culture wars or attacking people or uh, trying to, uh, to best people, but rather to discover the truth together and to rejoice uh, in, in doing that together and discerning God's will. So I, I think that as we hear so much about synodality today and so many questions are raised, I, I like to hold up Lorenzo as a wonderful example of what Pope Francis is trying to achieve. Beautiful, thank I you. 
I'd love to jump in there on that um, because I I just I agree with you, Your Eminence. The when I heard about Pope Francis calling for synodality, the first person that popped into my head was Lorenzo Albacete. And you know, I I'd like to say a few things about that, um, kind of in relationship to the the themes of the book. That because I think it's very easy to look at someone like um, Monsignor Bassetti and say, well, you know, it was really in for him, it was just all about being a really good listener and tuning in and, you know, meeting people where they're at. But I think there was actually something maybe even more profound going on with him. And, and I have to say, every time I read this book again, and of course, in the course of editing it, you go through it many, many, many times, I'm, I'm, I am challenged and converted by his approach. And so I wanna, I wanna say something about that right now. Um, I mentioned in the little bio I gave that, um, that Monsignor had this incredible capacity for friendship and you brought that out to your eminence. Um, and you know, a lot of the friendships were with the most unlikely people. And certainly the friendships that he developed with, uh, with what I would consider the media elites in New York City um, fit in that camp. And I think there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful story in the book that illustrates the, his capacity for friendship. He was invited to a party with, um, with a group of these people. And at the party, they, they all sat and watched a documentary. And the documentary was about a British writer who uh, was suffering from a terminal illness. And it really documents kind of his final days, how he struggles to, to, con to, finish one of his, uh, his great piece of work um, despite his suffering. And at the end of watching this documentary, everybody present was, was sitting there talking about how they were just blown away at this man's courage, um, his capacity for perseverance at the end of his life in the face of this terminal illness. And, the, um, and the, the hostess turned to Monsignor. And so, you know, what do you think? What do you think about this? this uh, this movie that we just wa watched. And I'm, I'm gonna read a little bit from, from actually the, what Monsignor says here, because it, it says a lot about who he was. Um, he turns to them and he tells them, as he says, to their amazement, that he was in fact very sad. I was very sad, very de depressed by what I saw. So everybody there was saying, was amazed and he was depressed. They asked, how could it be? This man's attitude to life and death was inspiring, heroic, an example to us, of all of us, of spiritual maturity, they insisted. I said, well, maybe, but in the end, he's dead. He's gone. I am sad at that. I am depressed that for all this spiritual strength and hero heroism, he's gone. I will never be able to meet this man. I miss him. You know, it, for Mon Monsignor, he prefaced, I should say, he prefaced this by saying, before he spoke, he said, I decided to take seriously my own advice. And this is the important point. Listen to your heart. Do not ignore anything. Be attentive to reality. I mean, that, that's a son of Giuseppe there, if I ever heard one. But that expresses what Monsignor was about, which was going all the way to the depth of where the human heart is. And in, and in, the, in, in, in any given situation, there was this desire, there was always this desire in him to get to the bottom of what, what the heart was really all about. Now, in this situation, that was extremely risky. I mean, he was there, he was kind of the, the, the token Catholic priest. He would joke about this. You know, I was the, the token Catholic priest in the room. And, and when, when people turned to him, you know, what was expected was, some some inspiring words, something that would lift everybody up. But he wasn't going to do that. He was going to go to where he really was. There was this desire to risk his heart in front of other people. And this was very, um, this was classic. This was part of his personality, but also part of his theology, right? Because the human heart longs for the infinite. And the only way that we can discover this longing is by being completely straightforward and truthful with the way that we're actually made, with what we're actually experiencing. And I think that that's really, um, it kind of brings us to the heart of the whole, the whole issue of, of dualism in the culture, right? Because, because um, 
we're tempted when we're, if we're religious people to give religious answers. And yet what is really required is to go to the bottom of our hearts because there is this thrust, this desire for God. It's inside of us and it's, and it's something that we can trust. And this was the thing that you always had the sense with, with Monsignor Albacete, that he, he had complete and total trust in the kind of trajectory of the way God had made him. I mean, he, he really was, you know, he really exemplified that restless heart of Augustine, you know, that he was going to let his heart come all the way out and that that, and that, that, that heart had, um, had an answer in the person of Jesus Christ. So um, I think that for me, like the, the, the idea of being present to others that we saw in Monsignor Abbasete, I mean, it was, what, it was something like what Giussani called a presence. You know, he had, he had a capacity to live his humanity in front of other people. And, um, and whether they were religious or not, it was attractive. It was, it was disarming. Um, it made you feel free to be who you were and to live your humanity. And that's really what gets you on the path to Christ. Absolutely. I agree with that. And I think at the heart of dualism was, was Monsignor Abbasetti's recognition that the incarnation is the ultimate model for us. It's the perfect balance of these aspects of the human person, the flesh and the spirit, justice and mercy, heaven and earth. And part of the reason that we live in a world of culture wars and, and dualism is that we tend to separate these things and we tend to think we pick one side, you know, and, and we can characterize the right in different ways. It tends to emphasize justice and the left mercy. And you can go down the line with that. I don't want to bog us down, but I, I really think that that wholeness, that unity, that incarnational unity was at the heart of his um, vision. And I think it's, of course, easy when we talk about synodality to mock the idea of dialogue, because dialogue is people just shooting off their mouth and saying whatever they want and nothing will ever happen. But it's important to remember with Monsignor, is that as good a listener as he was, he as a person in dialogue, he, he wasn't shy about speaking. And he spoke with a very robust basis in an idea that faith and reason were ways of knowing the world. And it wasn't just that he listened and, and whatever anyone said, he, as you say, in that cocktail party, he risked a lot to speak his mind and say, I'm sad that this man is dead. He's gone. I miss him. Something's wrong with the universe. The death exists in it. And I'm going to tell you that I believe that. And, and, and that, of course, intrigued people rather than put them off. And they wanted to talk more deeply. What is this deeper Catholic tradition from which you speak? And I think that's what's so powerful. Here's just a short quote about dualism that I found really powerful from the book. He says, the culture is defined in terms of how we look at and experience reality. The real choice is between a dualism that separates the sacred and the secular, the flesh and the spirit, and a unified incarnational vision. All of this is sustained by the grace of the encounter with Christ. It's unexpected, but it isn't a purely mental operation or purely spiritual. It occurs through someone in a given place at a given time. Fidelity to that particularity is essential because that, <coughs> excuse me, keeps us within the orbit of the encounter, sustaining our approach to the real. And here's, here's the part that I really love. Christians are not here to show a specifically Catholic genius or to engage in a battle. We are here to give witness to our faith, yes, but also to really live with the confidence that that same faith gives us to understand what is real, what is being seen, what is being lived. Again, this awakens interest, and with interest, light. This is the only way. I love that. I think it's that that's from from the talk or from the essay. Everything is grace, right? And and um and I, you know, that draws there. Monsignor was drawing on that beautiful quote from Saint Therese from her last conversations, right? Everything is grace. Um, the same quote that Bernanos picks up in the diary of a country priest. He puts it in the mouth of the dying priest. Everything is grace, and that's another way into the whole. Um, 
the whole prob problematic of dualism that you were talking about, because, you know, here Monsignor emphasizes that, that Christianity is a gift, right? The encounter that we, you know, what, what, makes, it, what makes Christians different from non-Christians? It's not that we have a better, well, you know, we do have a great set of rules, I guess I would say, but it's not, it's not primarily our set of rules. It's not primary. It's what's different is that we've had an encounter with the person of Jesus Christ, right? Which is an unmerited, a gratuitous encounter. Something has come, some, some, someone has happened to us. And that's what Christians bring into the world, right? It's not primarily, uh, I mean, this is the, this is the challenge, right? Is of, of, uh, what we're, what we're tempted to do is to think that what we bring is a certain um, is a certain set of rules, a certain set of guidelines, but what we bring is the person of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, a lot of things flow from that, but to start with Christ gives a totally different approach to our encounters with others, right? To the conversations that you were talking about, your eminence. I mean, that's, that's really where, where Monsignor always started. Yes, and uh, in today's world where for so many science comes to replace religion, uh, Lorenzo understood that, you know, uh, as St. Anselm says, that, that uh, it's fides querens intellectum, intellectus queris fida. Faith is... is uh, seeking to achieve understanding and understanding helps to lead us to the faith and his background in in science uh, combined with his deep theological reflection uh, made him a wonderful apostle for uh, people in today's world that uh, under the uh, influence of secularism are looking to science for answers to the ultimate questions and those uh, we need to look to the stars to find uh, uh, those answers. Right. I wonder and, if I can jump in here or, or Greg, please go ahead. No, I was just going to say that the one of the things he that corresponded to his personality, but that Giussani really helped him to fully articulate was a critique of what he called what, what has been called moralism. Moralism is precisely this idea that you put, you know, the rules first, and that that our ability to follow the rules is what sets us above others, or becomes the basis of our critique of others. The, the sort of restless driving, you know, need to to put your case that that others are wrong and we are right, that that others behave badly and we behave well that I think he understood was really a deeply unchristian way of, uh, and that's not to say that these things don't matter, they do. He cared about morality deeply, but but starting from Giussani, what he, what he felt most deeply was that morality comes from a living relationship with another, right? That, that, that morality, the source of morality is my honoring of a relationship I have to someone else, doing right by them caring for them, caring for my encounter with this other. And in that sense, if the living relationship, if, if that encounter is not uh, foremost in my, in my mind, then I'm, I'm not going to be interested in behaving rightly. So he, it wasn't that he had, again, no, uh, that, that morality was an empty category for him, not at all. He, he believed that it was a matter of priority and the centrality of a lived faith out of which this grew and which corresponded to the great complex edifices, as Cardinal Sean said to us, of, of the Catholic intellectual tradition, that those, those dovetail together. But if they weren't growing out of a lived experience, then they become nothing more than a tribalistic, a party um, in which uh, you know one party is is constantly driven by the need to defeat the other party at the polls, and that is not the faith. That is not that is not how the faith grows and and catches on, and 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 renews both church and culture. Yeah, uh, that's excellent. I'm just thinking as you as you speak, Greg. I think of uh, 
of Father Benedict, Pope, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, um, and he said we can't reduce Christianity to some program and ethics uh, when it's an encounter with the living God. Um, I think we'd agree, this is in the program, so Cardinal Sean as well, we need to luxuriate in the honey baritone of Lorenzo Albacetti. And so we have a clip here. Uh, it's not from the famous debate with Christopher Hitchens, which is a, a great one. And in that debate, he totally disarms Hitchens, if you watch it. He disarms Hitchens for all the reasons that, that, that you three are citing. He enters into a relationship with him and Hitchens doesn't know what to do uh, because you know he almost it doesn't beat him with his own stick, but it's, it's rhetorically interesting. Um, to uh, watch that debate. And I just recommend watching Albacete. I'm gonna show you why. Here's a five minute clip. It, it won't seem long, but it takes us deeper into your questions, you three. And I think it'll spring us back into a uh, commentary response and then we'll get some of our listeners in as well. So I'm gonna share a screen as they say, I'm gonna do my clicks. That's all good. Technology's working and here he is, Monsignor Albacete. For that reason, for that reason, because of that, I want to know, is there a way, a reasonable way, a reasonable method by which I can verify the, the claims or, of, the, of the religious experience, of a religious contribution, if I'm trying to find the minimalist language possible, religious contribution to the way I see life and leave it. And, and I, I believe that there better be, because if there isn't, then I am completely uninterested in the subject. How does one, uh, how might one do that? What we really have to do, I believe, and in this, I am entirely dependent to a man, the, the founder of the movement that I follow, and that I'm more or less, I don't know what the heck I really am, concerning the movement in the United States, is a book called The Religious Sense by Father Luigi Giussani. In so many ways, God at the Ritz is the total vulgarization of the religious sense. If you want a more serious, more uh, presentation of what is here, which quotes uh, Monty Python and everybody and Broadway shows, because I don't know Italian poets, here is you know, Dante, and that's the kind of it's amazing, good stuff real key, all of that material. But here in my book, I try to bring it down to my humble level. The question is, there is me and there is reality out there. What we need to investigate, I believe, and this is very important because a discussion about this is already a dialogue between people of faith and people who do not have faith, but both who are willing to submit to a reasonable analysis and evidence, something claimed to be evidence. What is claimed to be evidence here, what I think we should all look at, is our spontaneous reaction to reality. Better to investigate the structure at all levels, the structure of the human reaction to reality. The unleashing, unleashing of the question about why, and not only why, but what next, what next, the unleashing of reason itself, ground zero. And to observe oneself when that happens, most of the time, we have lost the purity of such a moment, but it's there, it's there. I remember I mentioned in my book a cartoon in the New Yorker in which this lady and her husband, very, very type New Yorker cartoon, New York resident people, are bringing the little baby out of the hospital, newborn, well, I mean, uh, born a few days, going back home in any case, and the taxis and the buildings and the canyons of Manhattan, everything are there. And then and the little baby is there, and, and then the lady says, Harry, look, Harry, the world. <laughs> I, that had this great impact on me. Suppose, suppose Harry could see or think or anything. 
What would have been his initial reaction when the world impacted him? His initial, zero, before anything starts. And uh, Monsignor Giussani in his book talks about a, a mental experiment. Uh, suppose you could go back into the womb and come out having, however, your awareness, your, the way you, your consciousness of yourself that you have now, but not having had the experience of anything else but you. What would be your first reaction? Now this is, again, if you make a claim and the other person say, no, I don't think so, etc. To me, I am satisfied because again, I could, I could confirm it by even looking at that cartoon that the immediate reaction is surprise. Oh, marvel, wonder, oh, look, Harry, the world. She herself, was communicating that experience to Harry. Again, Harry had no idea what was going on. But had he been able to see, he would have marveled, wonder, stupor. All of these are words that, that resonate in what I'm trying to, to explain. I have them here, stupefaction, to be overcome by wonder, to be invaded by wonder, to grasp reality as an event. That is, it's not just there, it's, it, it, it has touched you. It, it has attempted to initiate, or, or you want to initiate a dialogue with it, an event, a presence, a marvel, something totally given to you. You are not, one thing is clear. You are not the author of that. Whatever that is and whatever it's coming from before you begin classifying it or doing anything, you are not its author. So it's, uh, you, you, you run into it. So uh, the, the original activity, if you wish, is in fact a form of passivity. It's a, a receiving, a taking note of, a recognizing. It is to become aware of an inexorable presence that attracts, but which is always beyond and always other, 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 the radical otherness of it. But yet it is a radical otherness that attracts, that is tempting me, like it's seducing me, you see. And that launches one. The important thing is not to stop to continue pursuing that experience, to see where it goes. What do you think? That was a really well chosen clip. I have to say <laughs> that was excellent editing on your part um, because that was, Jam packed. I feel that uh, Monsignor yeah. Albacetti is kind of uh, part of our conversation. That 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 was yeah. Thank you. That was a vintage Lorenzo. Yeah, that was at Columbia, in 2011. Um, you know, Greg. You know, the Levertov, the wonder that there, there's anything, anything at all, something like that. Yes, absolutely. The the givenness of our life, um, the awareness of being born. Uh, where Slant's actually publishing a book by Giussani. It's a dialogue book with another thinker coming out uh, next month uh, called The Meaning of Birth. And that that kind of existential awareness, that sense of, of uh, you know, it goes back to Aristotle, of course, all, all learning begins with wonder. Um, and this is not touchy feely, right? This is, this is, these are fundamentally human experiences that we forget when we get more and more abstract, we abstract and abstract, everything becomes an ideological system. But, but this was Monsignor's gift was, was bringing us back to our experience. What is, how do we live? How are, he would say, you know, following Jasani, observe yourself in action. Um, and that's a challenge. It's very easy to forget. Um, it's easier to try to just think the correct thoughts and do the correct things, but you're not living a life. 
and you have no desire to do those things because you're not connected to this origin, this source of yourself that he so beautifully points out here. I love the, the, the whole, I mean, what I really love about that is it, it highlights the, the idea of wonder and this, like he even used that word stupefaction in front of reality. Um, it just seems to me that, you know, when we were, we were talking about what to, what to name this book, Greg made a strong case for the relevance of the stars, which is what we, we came up with. And, you know, people, people will ask me, well, what are the stars, right? What, what, why the stars? And, and the point is, you know, there's this great uh, story, classic story from Jasani. Um, he was, you know, walking one night and he comes upon two young lovers making out in a car and he goes right up to them in full cassock and taps them on the shoulder and says, hey, do you, you know, what you're doing right now, what does it have to do with the stars? And, and the thing is that I love about that story, it's, it's, is, and it really expresses what we love about Monsignor Abbasate is that in front, of, in front of this encounter of these two young lovers, there's, there's wonder in front of their desire for, you know, their love for each other, their passion. But, that, but then always to go deeper, like what does this open up? What does this open you up to, this experience in the world? So in every, in every human experience, there's this, there's something given and that that give is, givenness is something that we can, that, that is ultimately going to open us up to the ultimate reality, the mystery, the infinite. Um, but to live in wonder in front of all of these experiences, that was, that was Monsignor to a T. You couldn't be around him and not, um, not have your eyes be opened to something new. Great. Uh, panelists, uh treasured guests, we have questions now. Uh, I wanna ask, uh, we had a, a book club, uh, Relevance of the Stars at Loyola uh, and uh, students and graduate students and a couple of faculty. And we've asked a student to uh, enter into our conversation. That's Emma Mitchell, who is a senior. Uh, so can we unmute Emma and Emma, welcome to the, to the party, <laughs> to, the Alba, to the Albacete party. And uh, we'd love to hear what you, what you think. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you. Uh, as someone who would not have heard of Monsignor Albacete if it wasn't for this book and the Zoom call and the reading group that I get to be in, I'm very grateful that you're all here and sharing him and his work. Um, a question that I was wondering, I guess I have two questions that you guys can choose which one you would like to answer. One of them is in terms of editing the book, is there any idea of Albacete's or any characteristic of him that you feel you maybe weren't able to communicate as well as you would have wished or any, yeah, anything that you wish you could have included in the book that is you weren't able to do to your satisfaction. Um, and then another question, just in the spirit of encounter and uh person yeah personal encounter if you guys could share any other anecdotes of albacete particularly ones that um offer you a lot of hope i found that his ideas um are very comforting and kind of encouraging almost and just their their faith in what is real and what can be known and recognized and just the security in that. So I found Albacete's ideas to be, yeah, very, very comforting and encouraging in that way. So if you guys have any particularly comforting or hope giving ideas of Albacete that you would like to share with all of us, I'm sure we would all like to hear them a lot. Thank you. I'm happy to jump in on the question about the editing. Thank you so much, Emma. I have to tell you, you're completely inspiring me. When I, I saw in the email earlier that there was an Albacete book club, <laughs> I, was, I was super excited about that and super excited that you're here. Um, I would say for me, I'm sure Greg has his own answer because we, you know, we had to do, a, as he pointed out, we had to do a fair amount of editing with this work because Monsignor never, you know, he never did, uh, 
he didn't pol you know, he he was brilliant, but he didn't take time to polish his own writing for publication. And so we were always um, we were always you know working um, as editors. And I would say the thing that I I wish we could have put more in is is his humor. I I really feel that um, uh, there. <laughs> You know, I would just I would just encourage people to watch the YouTube videos. Um, that video we just watched was amazing because you you encounter his depth of thought. Um, but he he is um, wickedly funny, and I think he's one of these people for whom humor was not just a you know it wasn't just making a joke to put people at ease. It was literally a way to be with you, to be with others and to be his full human self. So he was, as you could see in that little clip, it, it, the jokes were, uh, he was off his, often the butt of his own jokes. And I think it was just very characteristic of his humility and his humanity. Um, so that would be, I wish we could have gotten more of that in the book. <laughs> what do you think, Greg? Um, here's a little <laughs> flavor of the humor. At one point, he's talking about the relationship between, again, morality and faith, morality and life. And he says, I have an example to share with you. He says, I have a friend in Italy who is a crook, a thief. He is retired now, but on occasion he works as a consultant, an expensive one at that, with stores seeking to update their security systems. He really was an excellent crook. No jewelry store was safe from his exceptional talent. On one occasion, though, he was una unable to do his work. He and his companions were already inside the store when suddenly he saw an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He immediately canceled the robbery. His accomplices were amazed. Are you afraid of a statue, they asked him? No, he said. It's the Blessed Virgin, La Madonna, my mother. How can I be afraid of her? Then why are you calling off the job, they asked. He explained, because tomorrow, when the robbery is discovered, people will say she was unable to protect them. And so they went and robbed another store. And this is, <laughs> this is an anecdote that he tells precisely to say, in terms of morality, true morality versus moralism, that you know, morality stems not from the fact that we behave better than others or we live up to even our own moral rules, but morality, the source of morality is that something has been given to us. Some, the, the, the source of, of, of morality is our gratitude and wonder at the gift of faith, a gift of salvation that Christ brings us. And it's that, it's that as he puts it in the clip, the passivity or the re reception of what has been given that is the, is the sort of foundation, the cornerstone of all true morality and not that we score a higher percentage than other people. Because he says, if that's the criterion, then we're really screwed. You have a thought, Cardinal Sean? I, I was just thinking of the the video that was presented on the Albacete Hour or whatever it was called at the end, where the child asked him, you know, why did God make dinosaurs? I thought that Lorenzo, it was once again vintage uh, Albacete, the response, and uh, he uses this as an indication to a proof of God's superabundance love for the sun and the incarnational aspects of it are so important. But uh, the, he was, and this was just a spontaneous response to the child, but it was just filled with such great theology and wisdom. Typical Lorenzo. Yeah, you know, uh, thinking more about that all kind of compiles together, but um, I, I, for some reason, associate G.K. Chesterton to a point with Lorenzo because their G.K. C. finishes orthodoxy with the great secret of Jesus was his mirth. And, you know, uh, Albacete, Monsignor, you know, another line by Chesterton is that um, funny is not the opposite of serious. It's the opposite of not funny. And so, you know, you can get a lot of mileage out of that. Um, but uh, let me just throw another question now. We have many in advance. There was a lot of questions in advance about Albacete being a voice to overcome uh, polarization. And so we, I think we've hit those, those topics. Um, there are other questions about people want, people want to hear anecdotes about 
uh, all the friendships that Albacete have with uh, Commonweal editor, editor David Toulin, uh, with uh, other friends around town, of course, Charlie Rose and Bill Moyers, the PBS crowd who loved him so dearly. So there's that. There's also a question though about what would Albacete, what's his view on, on something like um, an important issue in the church, women and their roles in the church? Anybody have a thought on that? Well, I'm a woman, so I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I have to tell you that I was a student on, under Monsignor Albacete at the John Paul II Institute, which was at the time in the Dominican House of Studies. Um, so we had uh, a handful of female students and a lot of young seminarians and young theology graduate students. And I experienced um, Monsignor Albacete as being absolutely encouraging of my own, of my own, my own personal path, um, studying theology. Um, I think that he, you know, he was a, he was a student, he was an adherent of Pope John Paul II. I, I would say, you know, the, the amazing and beautiful things that are said in Malayaris Dignitatum about the, the dignity of women, their capacity to bring um, a, a, a way of interacting with persons into the world and, and being leaders in the way of witnessing to self-giving love. I, I would say he was, he was all behind all of that in, in the most profound theological way, but also personally was personally encouraging of my own path. Thank you, Lisa. Anybody else want to uh, want to weigh in on on that very important uh, issue? I would just say Lorenzo had many very deep friendships with women that were very life giving for him, and. Uh, I think, you know, there was nothing uh, machista about his attitude towards women. It was the farthest, uh, uh, that kind of a, an attitude just did not, uh, did not exist in him. Uh, I think there's a danger of stressing too much uh, Lorenzo's sense of humor, because it's not just a matter of fun. Uh, he was a joyful person. And that joy, even uh, in the midst of uh, great suffering and challenges and health problems and financial problems uh, and losing jobs and all these other things, uh, his faith allowed him to know how beloved he is to God. And, uh, and that made him a joyful person. And when we read about the joy of the gospel, this is the way that the, the gospel is spread by, not by uh, good humor, but by having that joy that comes from a, a relationship with God and a deep awareness of how much our God loves us, uh, as Benedict puts in the encyclical, quoting St. John's, you know, we've come to discover God's love. And Lorenzo discovered that, uh, and beginning uh, with the great love that he received from his family, and, uh, and that love transformed him and made him a joyful person, even in the midst of a valley of tears. Thank you, Cardinal Sean. That's be beautifully put. Um, Gregory? Just going to say, you know, he was irreverent in the way that only somebody with deep reverence can be. Um, that sense, again, of, of the, the serious and the hilarious, um, that is an incarnational, it, this is the word that I just keep coming back to, it's an incarnational vision. And um, you know, he wants, this was a movement thing, so he could probably be excused a little bit from departing from the theological norm, but he ended, he ended the mass. He said, the mass has ended. Bye. <laughs> and just this, the freedom that he had. I mean, 
so many of us operate under a feeling of constant constraint um you know how do people look at us and and am i doing the right thing and he he was just blissfully free of that he 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 didn't draw boundaries where we we are socially expected to i mean he, he had a sibling for example with severe mental and emotional challenges and when that sibling called him he would always take the call and in fact, one of the times that I witnessed, he was speaking in front of an audience of, I think, 500 people, and his phone rang, and it was his sibling, and he picked up the phone, and he carried on a conversation in the middle of the talk. And I just, the, the charity of that, the boldness of that, the kind of freedom of that, to me, speaks uh, of a world of, that's the tip of the iceberg, that huge element underground is all the, the theological, intellectual Catholic tradition that's there. And yet, you know, the point is we see only the tip of the iceberg and we only need to see the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's it's going to exist when that that ballast is there of everything. Um, but it's, it's this beautiful, you know, uh, thing that we encounter that, that enchants us and inflames us and attracts us. And that's what he he was able to reflect so beautifully. And I always enjoyed it when people asked him, what is communion liberation? And he would respond, it's Opus Day for bad people. <laughs> well, Cardinal Sean, back to your joy observation. It's wonderful. It's very, it seems to me, uh, maybe a short trip, but very Franciscan to say that, you know, uh, giving St. Francis, uh, I think they had the real gift of joy. And uh, the freedom that Pope Francis has, he's another very free person. Uh, that was remarkable when, in his papacy. We're moving to the end here. Uh, we want to allow uh, time for prayer. Um, but I just want to note a couple of things. I want to thank people for their questions. Um, uh, Stephen, uh, pardon me, Stephen John Fogel's question. And then Ernest Rubenstein, Rubenstein, forgive me, also has a question, which I'll get to in a second, but I do want to put a light on Olivetta Donessi, excuse me, who works with a New York Encounter. And she, she uh, uh, texted me the Albacete Forum link where you can watch a beautiful one hour video of Monsignor uh, Albacete, and we encourage you to do so. But here's, or here's our last question. It's uh, maybe just a quick comment. And then Lisa, we want to hear from you. Um, what about the role of doubt in this? was you know there's joy in monsignor was there any doubt and what role does that play in a life of faith that's a really intense question i mean i mean I, the thing is about about monsignor Abbasete was he lived a full humanity and doubt is part of our full humanity right. and there there was absolutely nothing um you know, my, my impression as a, you know, an impressionable young theology student, so I met him when I was 21 years old, um, sitting in his class, and maybe even the first class was, here was a man who lived the full spectrum of humanity. So we saw him joyful, we saw him funny, we saw him, like you were just saying, Greg, unhappy, challenged, um, uncertain, and it was, it was all there. And I think the thing about Monsignor was that it was all open to Christ. You know, there, there was it, there were, it, it was no holds barred Christianity when you were with him. And that was what was so attractive. And we could also do an entire session just based on um, the amazing providential gift of his being present uh, at when 9-11 happened. Um, which he later, you know, formalized when Helen Whitney made a documentary about faith and doubt at Ground Zero, which is an amazing program. And Albacete is in some ways the beating heart of that. And the his willingness to be completely unguarded, um, you know, not only about his grief uh, and the doubt that this kind of evil and destruction, you know, causes us to feel, but uh, but you know, in a sense, even more than that, his, his sense that he recognized a kinship with the bombers, the, the suicide, you know, plane uh, 
people. Uh, and he said, this is religion. This is, this, is, this is at least an aspect of religion that I recognize in myself. The danger of an absolutism, of an ideology that nonetheless has some kind of deep connection to what I hold most dear. It may be a corruption of it, but I recognize it and I sense a kinship. And this causes me to take it even more seriously and not to stigmatize these people and to try to understand how, how something good can become evil. He was present and a consoling voice precisely because of that, that absolute honesty, you know, at a, at a time of absolute national and, and existential catastrophe. Thank you so much, Greg. That's wonderfully put as well. Really, really important. Something to think about for sure. Lisa and Greg, thanks for your book. Uh, congratulations. Cardinal Sean, we'll give you the last word and I would uh, request and, and I really appreciate you, you uh, taking us out with prayer. Thank you very much, Cardinal. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for bringing us together tonight and giving us this opportunity to reflect on this wonderful book that if it had not been for your efforts and determination, uh, would never have come to light. But uh, you have allowed us to be able to glimpse once more the, this great uh, astro astronomer uh, of, the, of the stars and uh, our dear friend Lorenzo. Uh, I, I'm sure that he is praying for all of us as we uh, talk about him here tonight. And I would encourage those who have not read his books to please do so. And uh, I'm glad that you brought up the uh, possibility of people uh, seeing that wonderful video on the Albacete Forum. If people have not had the opportunity to know Lorenzo personally uh, it's an opportunity to uh, to catch a glimpse of his extraordinary uh, gifts of personality, of intellect, and of spirituality. And now let us ask for God's blessing. O oh God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of love. Inspire in us a dream of renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to create healthier societies and a more dignified world, a world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. Grant us the love reflected in the actions of Jesus and his family of Nazareth and in the early Christian community. Grant that we Christians may live the gospel, discovering Christ in each human being, recognizing him crucified in the sufferings of the abandoned and forgotten of our world, and risen in each brother or sister who makes a new start. Come, Holy Spirit, show us your beauty reflected in all the peoples of the earth, so that we may discover anew that all are important and all are necessary, different faces of the one humanity that God so loves. And this we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you, Your Eminence. And thank, thank all you. of you. God yes. Pleasure. Thanks, Greg Wolf. Thanks, Lisa Lacona, so much. Uh, good thank night. You. Good night, good viewers, night. and God bless everybody. And happy Thanksgiving, one and all. Thanks so much. Thank Bless you. you.